Princess Jellyfish, it's fucking great, people. The Math Rock OP is great. It's hot cross-dressing boy is great. It's just the 2D men that get to me. I'm a lesbian, I swear. And Schemi's a great protagonist. Look at this face. How couldn't you love this face? So for those of you who don't know the know, this is the show where I hold the poll. When I hold the poll, I have the goal of knowing what show I'm gonna go watch. Ooh, and then I'm on the clock. I've only got a month before I've got to talk about the show that my patrons chose. It only costs three to be one of those, and so... Here we are, chatting about the first poll's winner, Princess Jellyfish. So, Princess Jellyfish is a really interesting anime. First and foremost, it mixes hilarious, absurd gag humor with tear-jerking character drama in a manner pretty reminiscent of 2018's standout comedy anime Hinamatsuri. What it's most well-known for, however, is the cross-dressing of one of its main characters, Kuronosuke. And while a look into cross-dressing and the broader nature of gender is something that unsurprisingly greeted me as I sat down and watched through the series, I was surprised to find everything from real estate politics to an exploration of otaku to also be among the variety of topics that gets covered here. Princess Jellyfish is a dense series, dense with jokes, dense with pesos, and dense with ideas it's interested in examining. It also happens to have ended up being one of the most purely enjoyable viewing experiences I had with anime in 2018, so let's dive right into things. <laughs> In spite of what many of the comments on my trap video would have you believe, I do not think that a character is trans simply by virtue of dressing like a girl, and Kudanosuke is one case where my read of things is him being a cis crossdresser. He isn't just a crossdresser for the sake of giving him a character quirk, though, as his crossdressing ends up serving multiple functions for the series. And this brings us to the other gender stuff Princess Jellyfish explores, society's conception of womanhood. Our main character, Tsukimi, lives in an apartment building with a collection of similarly frumpy women who collectively refer to themselves as the Sisterhood, due to the fact that none of them have boyfriends and none of them ever expect to. Throughout the series, Tsukimi will flash back to a formative moment for her, when at the aquarium, her mother told her that one day she'd make her a wedding dress like the jellyfish's captivating frills, and that every girl grows up into a beautiful princess. Schemi references this statement multiple times when thinking about what she perceives as a failure on her part to grow into that princess her mother laid out as her destiny. She still holds that statement to be mostly true, and primarily places the blame on herself, apologizing to her mother in internal monologue for messing up somewhere along the way and turning out how she did. Where Kuronosuke factors into all of this is that he has achieved this perfect fairy tale womanhood, and yet it's a womanhood that is entirely constructed. Coming into contact with this ends up causing the sisterhood, and most of all Tsukimi, to reassess their conception of and relation to society's standards of womanhood. As Tsukimi is considering how perfectly Kuronosuke fits this role, how he's a true princess, and calls him the complete opposite of me, she finds out that he's actually a guy, which raises a number of questions. If he can simply adopt this ideal womanhood, could she? And if it can be so easily constructed, even by those who aren't true princesses, how much value does it even have in the first place? Kuronosuke does even more to destabilize this idea of womanhood when he gives all the members of the sisterhood makeovers, and calls it dressing for battle. The battle in question is the fight to keep the apartment building from being bought up by the real estate people trying to redevelop the area. Kuronosuke wouldn't actually ask them to change their style in a way that's untrue to themselves. He says as much himself to them. But, he says, in a world where people judge based upon appearances, if you're confronting those people, you need to be properly equipped to do so. This further destabilizes the concept of idealized womanhood by making it not just something that can be artificially adopted, but something to be employed in a tactical manner. I'd say that the series' approach to this subject of womanhood is not to try to position it as a wholly harmful cultural invention being thrust upon girls, though. Schemi still wants to wear that jellyfish dress, and the series views that as an entirely fine desire to have. It just wants to take away that fairy tale mystique this womanhood often has for people. 
Tsukimi can be outright gorgeous when someone who knows how to do makeup and hair has their way with her, breaking down the strict binary between those who are and aren't princesses. Even seemingly naturally beautiful women like the developer lady are using makeup and other tricks to enhance things and are still self-conscious about their own appearances. Princess Jellyfish expresses the idea that even if it comes more naturally to others, this womanhood is ultimately something adopted by anyone who exhibits it, not inherent to them. Because of that, it also asserts that you aren't a failure if you don't take part in this womanhood, and holds personal expression in high regard. Which ties in with our next subject, the show's portrayal of otaku. The Sisterhood's members aren't just failed princesses, they're also hardcore otaku. In Japan, otaku are those with any obsessive interest or hobby, not just anime fans, with some of the other classic types being gun otaku and train otaku. Bamba is one such train otaku, Chiyoko is obsessed with traditional Japanese fabric and the dolls she puts them on, etc. And Skimi, as the title might suggest, is really, really into jellyfish. With them and the rest of the sisterhood, the series portrays a wide swath of otakudom, exploring the breadth it can have. And of course, it is portraying a cast of women who are otaku, some of them like the BL mangaka and the woman with a strong thing for older men, having their otaku obsessions be interests more likely to attract women, while many of them have interests that aren't particularly gendered. Princess Jellyfish has a little otaku empowerment narrative of sorts. Tsukimi's intense knowledge of jellyfish gets validated by the mainstream, normie if you will, society around her when her dress inspired by a jellyfish wins a fashion show. In participating in that competition, she's really forced to face the intense social anxiety that she and the rest of the sisterhood has, and through the validation of her interests she receives, she gains some confidence in this regard. The fact that this otaku empowerment narrative stars a female lead in instead of a male one doesn't create a ton of differences from the norm, but it does mean that there's five or six less half-naked, half-underage girls fawning over our main character, which is a refreshing novelty. More seriously though, the otaku protagonist being a woman leads to some different subject matter being explored, where for male-led series, their social alienation often results from things like struggles with relating to women or failing to embody traditional masculinity. For Tsukimi, it's her struggles living up to idealized womanhood that we talked about earlier. In spite of the mix of different elements it's got at play, Princess Jellyfish manages to get them to feed into each other and support one cohesive vision in a way that's really admirable. I knew this series was going to be a good one, but I hadn't anticipated just how fantastic it'd end up being. The winner of this month's poll was Pandora in the Crimson Shell, where robot lesbians finger each other to activate their transformation sequences, so look forward to my upcoming video on that, and if you want to get in on this action and vote in the next poll, you can pledge $3 or more on Patreon and get access to that. Also, make sure to go join my new public Discord server linked in the description. If you're checking my channel out for the first time because of a shout out from a certain someone, hey there, hope you've enjoyed your stay thus far. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, well, they haven't put that video out yet, but look forward to it, it'll be coming soon and I'm very excited for it. I've worked together with four other anime YouTubers to put together our own 2018 anime awards show, so that'll be my next video, Get Hype. And of course, a major thank you to those supporting my work on Patreon. Psyker, Mathways97, Jonathan Conley, Tyler Monk, Tincho37, Lord Liquid Bacon III, Elaine Aldfelt, David McCown, Smokeweed Sephiroth420, Jman4747, Chase Sutter, Lucas Holcomb, Randall Hudson, Elaine Gilstrom, John Smith, Mad Marks, Booty Warrior GT, Gia Lee, Melody Heron Anderson, and everyone else supporting me already.